I admire your luck, Mr. Bond. James Bond. Why do we love James Bond movies? After over 50 years of production with no sign of stopping, these films seem to have everything. Maybe a part of it is simply a sense of the familiar. As a viewer, we've been here before. We've experienced the same beats time and time again. And it's awesome. It's unapologetic, over the top, just plain great entertainment. Let me ask you this. When you watch a Bond movie, what do you expect to see? Ridiculous action sequences? Cool gadgets? Bring that car back in pristine order? Gorgeous women? Bad puns? It wouldn't kill me. It'd miss me. I never miss. That one's my favorite. Bizarre villains? That was always the big draw for me, was the villains. When I was younger, watching James Bond movies was like watching Batman movies for me. I never really gave a shit about Batman. It was always about the villains. In a Bond movie, I would always want to know who the villain was going to be, what weird quirk they might have, and who their henchman is. The henchman is a staple of Bond movies. The lackey, the right-hand man. They're usually more eccentric, more out there, comic book type characters. And they can range from being super intimidating to being a welcome source of comic relief. To celebrate the release of the new Bond movie, Spectre, I wanted to focus on three actors who specialized in playing these odd characters. They may not have gotten as much recognition as some of the other prominent characters over the years, but I think they deserve a brief spotlight. Let's get to know the James Bond henchman. I'll take some teas. Uh, yes, of course. Oh, you must excuse our job, Mr. Bond. He's an admirable manservant, but mute. He's not a very good caddy. Golf is not yet the national game of Korea, eh? <laughs> Odd Job is probably the most recognizable henchman from the Bond films. He was always my favorite, not just because he was iconic, but because when you played as Odd Job and Goldeneye for the N64, you were slightly shorter than everyone else who was playing, which made it harder for other people to hit you. Playing this game for years with my high school friends, we'd eventually start out playing Goldeneye by just saying, no Odd Job. Then it got to a point where we didn't even have to say no Odd Job, and if you played as Odd Job, you were a little baby. Odd Job was played by a man named Harold Sakata. This was his first acting job, and he was perfect for the part. He didn't have to say a word, and under the right circumstances, that can be more menacing than any amount of dialogue. Although this was his first gig as an actor, he was already an actor of sorts. But first, let's start with his early life. Harold Sakata, originally born Toshiyuki Sakata, was born on January 7, 1920, in Halualoa on the main island of Hawaii. His parents were both Japanese. His father, Risaburo Sakata, was an immigrant, and his mother, Matsu, was an American citizen. Harold had ten other siblings, six brothers and four sisters. As a child, he spent some time working on his parents' coffee plantation. This experience would eventually instill a hard work mentality that stayed with him in later years. He said, I didn't have an easy time working in the coffee fields and bringing home the money. Lots of times I wanted toys and wondered why life was so hard. He dropped out of high school in 1936 and pretty much worked in agriculture all over Hawaii. He left the coffee plantation around the age of 18 and worked at a sugar plantation and then a pineapple plantation. At age 18, Sakata was 5 foot 8 and weighed only 113 pounds. He decided to start lifting weights, stating, so I'd look as good as the other guys. After a year of training, he gained 20 pounds and decided to start entering lifting contests. From 1941 to 43, he won several light heavyweight championships. By that time, he was 165 pounds, pressing 250, snatching 240, and clean and jerking 310. He was a beast. At age 24 in 1944, Sakata did his duty and joined the U.S. Army to fight in World War II as part of the 1399th Engineer Construction Battalion, which was a Japanese Japanese-American unit known as the Chow Hounds. Although he never left the island, the War Department kept the entire unit in Honolulu building water tanks, warehouses, airfields, and roads. In between his war duties, Sakata continued lifting weights in the unit gym. After his discharge, he trained other weightlifters as well as continuing to compete professionally, leaving a string of accomplishments in his wake. One of his most impressive accomplishments was winning a silver medal for the United States in the 1948 Olympics. After dominating the world of weightlifting, Sakata decided to take up professional wrestling in 1949. He was billed as Mr. Sakata, the human tank. And because of his background as an Olympic medalist and war veteran, he played the good guy for a while, wrestling in the US, Canada, and Japan. 
Then, after a few years, he began playing the heel, or the bad guy, and he was billed as Tosh Tojo. Tosh Tojo was an asshole who allegedly threw salt in his opponent's eyes. He met his wife in 1951, and they had two children, John and Glenna. His marriage, unfortunately, fell apart in the early 60s as a result of him traveling so much for work. Then, in 1963, one of Sakata's wrestling matches was televised in Europe, where he was seen by producers Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli who are both working on producing the third installment of the James Bond franchise, Goldfinger. I was watching one Saturday afternoon, there used to be wrestling, and there was on television. Harold Zakata came on and everybody booed and there was odd job. And Harold Zakata had been a serious athlete, had been the first Hawaiian to get a silver medal at the Olympics. They had him audition, did a screen test, and cast him as odd job, the right hand man to Goldfinger, the main villain. Harold Zakata, the 284 pound wrestling sensation from Hawaii, is heading for a new career. If he passes his screen test, he'll play a murderous muscle man in the new James Bond movie thriller, Goldfinger. And what a screen test it is. Those were four blocks of walnut that can support an elephant. Now for footsies. This can really fracture you. Harold's toes hang together, the part is his. Here's Sakata's first scene in Goldfinger. He's mixing it up with Sean Connery, who stars as Special Agent James Bond in the United Artists adventure film. The setting is the U.S. Treasury's gold vault at Fort Knox. Uh, it looks like the first round goes to Sakata. With it goes the admiration of youngsters visiting the set. Like I said before, Sakata did well for his first acting job. His character was mute, so all he had to do was stand around and look menacing. It probably helped that he was so physically fit. At 5'10", the man weighed 284 pounds at the time of filming. Oddjob's iconic signature weapon was a bowler hat with a steel blade in the rim. Sakata practiced for five months trying to get the throw just right. It's not like throwing, he said. It's the whip, the spin, the slicing blade like a boomerang that never comes back. I worked with a plaster statue of a girl and aimed for the neck. I got so I could topple the head off every time. Like any first-time actor, working on a set was a bit of a learning curve. In a scene where he judo-chops Sean Connery from behind, he actually hit him so hard that Connery suffered a back injury. And he gave me that chop behind the neck at the fridge. He put me on the floor. He wasn't quite used to the cinema technique of taking it to the wire and then stopping, you know. And, uh, some days I think I still have it from then. And then there's the scene where Sakata is electrocuted by Bond. He was a joy to work with and a very brave man because in Fort Knox when those fireworks go off at the end, he got badly burnt and he was hanging on there. And I didn't say cut because all the sparks were flying everywhere and it looked good to me. So finally Harold thing and then he'd really um, burnt his hands. But guy, you didn't say cut. So I just hung on in there. After the release of Goldfinger, Oddjob was this immediately recognizable character, and Sakata became famous overnight. So what was life like for Sakata after Goldfinger? Sakata was so synonymous with the character of Oddjob that most of his roles were mute thugs who sometimes wore a bowler hat. No, seriously, he continued to wear the bowler hat for years, both off-screen and on. There are even some projects where he's wearing pretty much the exact same outfit, like the Donnie and Marie Osmond film Going Coconuts, Death Dimension, an episode of The Amazing Spider-Man, and The Wrestler. In The Wrestler, he's even credited as Oddjob. Can they do that? Then there are projects where it's obvious that he's just supposed to be playing Oddjob. Like on The Jerry Lewis Show, which is pretty much if he showed up on Saturday Night Live in the Oddjob outfit. All right, Rhoda, I am waiting for an explanation. He also did a series of Vicks cough syrup commercials in the late 60s and early 70s, dressed as Oddjob, destroying everything in sight because of his horrible cough. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's Vicks Formula 44, the extra strength cough mixture. <laughs> Effective as codeine, but not narcotic. Extra strength Formula 44 to help control a cough before it goes on a rampage. 
These commercials must have been popular because he showed up on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and destroyed his desk. The audience got a kick out of it. The honest truth of it, however, is that Sakata wasn't the best actor. Sure, he got better over the years, just from experience on set, but even so, in any scene where he had dialogue, he's not really there. He had Charlie's wallet, with this picture in it. He didn't create characters, he was just doing versions of Oddjob. And that seems to be exactly what producers wanted. I get the feeling that Sakata was just happy to oblige, and didn't worry so much about trying to break out and do something different as an actor. Plus, keep in mind, Sakata had already accomplished so much in the world of athleticism. He was still a phenomenal talent. It's unfair to judge him just based on his acting work. It's kind of like how Dan Marino played himself in Ace Ventura Pet Detective. He wasn't awful, it's just that he's a professional football player and not an actor. It was the same thing with Sakata. He was cast as arguably the most recognizable Bond henchman in the entire franchise, and he spent the rest of his acting career getting as much legwork out of that character as he possibly could. Nothing wrong with that, especially when you're trying to support a family. As the 70s wore on, Sakata continued to pop up in the occasional low-budget action movie or TV episode. Stop! Where you going? Put that silly thing away. I'm sure your mother would never approve of such conduct. No, has mother. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> but you must remember you're an uninvited guest on this island, and you do have certain social obligations. No, has obligation. <laughs> Didn't anyone ever tell you that it's rude to point? One of the last films he ever did was a 1982 Bruce Lee film called Ninja Strikes Back. Two Japanese men came here. They were ninja. I'm sure of it. Wait, are they playing the James Bond theme? You men, what do you want? Get out of here! Again, can they do this? Private I'm party. guessing they got permission. Why have you come? What do you want? Why have I come? I've come for your daughter! <laughs> His character had a gold hand that he stabbed his victims with. I guess it's like... gold fingers? <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's what they were going for. By this time, Sakata was 62 years old, and although he could still be pretty agile, his health started to fail him. In early 1982, he developed liver cancer. Perhaps one of the last times he appeared on camera was at the 1982 Academy Awards. The song, For Your Eyes Only, written for the Bond film of the same name, was nominated for an Oscar. For your eyes only, only for you. So Sheena Easton came out and sang over a choreographed, James Bond-themed dance routine. A few Bond villains made cameos, although half of them weren't played by the same actors. Richard Keel showed up playing Jaws, as well as Harold Sakata in his trademark suit and bowler hat. After this broadcast, Sakata died about six months later on July 29th, 1982. Looking back, Harold Sakata was first and foremost an entertainer. When he found wrestling, he thought he would do it for five years and then retire, but he ended up loving it so much he didn't want to stop. When he made the transition into acting, I think he really enjoyed it because he just wanted to entertain people. Even if he didn't get that part in Goldfinger, whatever he ended up doing in life, he would have been entertaining people, I guarantee you. It's kind of like Mickey Rourke's character in The Wrestler. Wrestling was his life, and when he was told he couldn't wrestle anymore due to health problems, he ends up working at a deli counter in a grocery store to support himself. Then, slowly over the course of a scene, we see him start to enjoy it, having fun and riffing with the customers, playing to an audience like he's back in the ring again. That's who I think Harold Sakata was. If the crowd was cheering, he was happy. That about wraps this episode up. Stay tuned later this month for two more episodes about James Bond henchmen. We'll be looking at the life and career of Richard Keel, who played Jaws, and Jeffrey Holder, who played Baron Samity. Thanks for watching, guys. No matter how strong a man is, a cough can still get the upper hand. But fortunately, there's Vicks Formula 44.